So um, yeah, um, good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our, oh, I've actually lost count. I should have looked this up. Third, fourth, third, fourth um, uh, European Fusion Teacher Day. Can someone remind me, is it the third or the fourth? Anyway, um, so we've been doing these for, for um, uh, a, a few years now, um, and it's brilliant that, that everyone has come along and joined. My name is Roddy Van. I am an academic um, at, so I'm a professor of physics at the University of York in the UK. I'm sorry about all the mess behind me. It's not as, it's even worse on my desk here. I'm not going to show you that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm a physicist at the University of York. I am interested in, as you would imagine, I'm interested in fusion. I do, so I teach second year electromagnetism and some graduate plasma physics. Um, and I also do research in tokamaks. And one of the reasons, actually, hopefully the bags under my eyes don't look too bad, but we've had a very exciting week because Mast Upgrade, which is a tokamak in the UK, has um, started getting plasmas in this experimental campaign just in the last two or three days. So I've been um, uh, trying to analyse data and that sort of thing. So I'm lucky enough to work um, in the national and, for that matter, international uh, fusion community. Um, but my role here today is as chair of the Board of Governors of FuseNet, which is much grander than it sounds. I'm sort of, well, uh, sort of dog's body type type role. Um, but it's it's my great pleasure to, to introduce you to um, today's event. Just want to say a couple of things, I think, about Fusion and about FuseNet, and I'm sure about education as well. Um, and um, I've got, I think I've just got three or four minutes. Um, I'll try not to, to waffle on too long. So fusion, look, I'm sure that in some sense I'm, I'm preaching to the converted or speaking largely to an audience who, who is sort of interested and excited by, by this anyway. But fusion, of course, is the process that powers the sun. It powers our nearest sort of working fusion reactor, 90 million miles or eight light minutes away. Um, this is our, our um, nearest sort of working full-time fusion reactor. Fusion, of course, is the is the, is the energy that powers the, the sun and, and all stars. And it's a really exciting idea that we can, um, that fusion might be a solution to the energy crisis that we find ourselves in. An energy crisis, of course, um, which has, um, which is associated with climate change and global warming, but of course is, is um, it's not all about that, is it? It's also about things like security of energy supply, and it's also about pollution, which in some ways is even more acute, if that's possible, than dealing with the, with the climate problem. And of course, it's no good just solving the energy problem for today's energy needs, but in order to give the entire population of the planet a decent standard of living, we need to also be able to produce more energy. So it's not just about producing our current energy needs more efficiently, but it's also about providing more energy so that everyone on the planet has a decent standard of living. That's not, a, of course, a sufficient condition, but it's least an, at least a necessary condition for that. And look, we need, to, we need to produce energy from as many sources as possible. We need to have a broad portfolio, but fusion perhaps is unique in its, its opportunities for carbon-free, um, safe, uh, fuel abundant supply from a centralized source. So I think fusion is very exciting, but of course, as you all know, it's very challenging and that's why we haven't done it. Well, in some sense, we haven't done it yet. But the other thing I was gonna say about fusion is that, that we're in a very exciting period. Um, we are moving, definitely now moving towards the reactor era. It's great that on, um, I'll find the time in a minute, here we go, that, that at 3.15 European time, you're going to have a, a virtual tour of ITER, which is a, um, I'm going to use probably slightly the wrong language, but it's a prototype reactor, fusion reactor currently being built in the south of France, and you will see just how advanced the construction of that is. But there are other machines that are, are be, either being planned or being um, built, which are not just experiments, they are prototype reactors and I won't if I give a list then I'll miss some of them out right and that would be unfortunate but there are um, initiatives across the world to build prototype fusion reactors and this is being supported by some decent a decent amount of money now there's decent investment in fusion and also this is being reflected in the number of um, private fusion companies as well which has really grown strongly over the last few years so fusion is in an extremely exciting place but 
perhaps the biggest risk to the fusion challenge, the fusion program, is not money and not political will, because to some extent, the, look, there's some extent to which if you want to throw money at a problem, of course, that's not trivial, but there's an extent to which you can do that. And there's an extent to which if we do a good job, hopefully we can persuade the public that fusion is a potential answer to some of these questions. But what we can't do really quickly is train people. And perhaps the biggest challenge with fusion over the next 10 years and 20 years as we move into this, this much larger um, fusion community environment, um, this, this reactor landscape, is that at the moment we just don't have enough people to fill the jobs. And this is true now, and this problem is going to become more acute as we go forward. And this isn't so obvious. I'm at a university, so I'm of course interested in things like doctoral training and you know the really academic end. But this is across the entire thinking about it commercially across the entire supply chain, and it's across the entire skills spectrum. Um, we need people. Um, who are um, not just in sort of the physics that I work in or diagnostics. We need people who can do high power engineering, who can do civil and mechanical in, in engineering within a fusion nuclear environment. We need the technical people um, who can actually drive the aspects of the tokamak and drive the aspects of the plant. We need the people who understand questions around regulation and decommissioning. We need under people who understand the interfaces to politics and economics. So the, there's a huge range of um, people who are required to take um, fusion forward. And we can't do this without you, the teachers. If we don't have you, we are going to fail in fusion. So this is absolutely crucial. So briefly, who is, I can see by the way, my time is up. I'll be, for those who are in charge organizing, I'll be one more minute, right? So what is FuseNet? FuseNet is the European Fusion Education Network. In the abbreviation FuseNet, we've kind of got the letters the wrong way around, but anyway, it sounds nice. So we're the European Fusion Education Network. Um, we do a lot of work with Eurofusion, which is the, in some sense, the EU fusion funding body, but we work, I mean, I'm, I'm in the UK, so we, we do work outside Eurofusion and even internationally. And it's great to see that there are um, participants registered today from 33 countries um, some of whom are not inside Europe. So, I mean, if we have a bit of a global reach, that's great, but our primary focus is, is, within, um, is in, within Europe. And whilst the bulk of our effort is on master students and to a lesser extent, PhD students, we've come to realize over the last few years that if all we do is look at postgraduate education, then we're really not in any way addressing the pipeline issue, the fact that we need more people in fusion. So it's, it's really exciting for us that, that FuseNet, the European Fusion Education Network, go and have a look at our website, FuseNet.eu. And I'm sure Luke and Dario and um, Sandra and the rest of my colleagues at FuseNet will, um, uh, will tell you a little bit more about how to contact people through the day. But if you have any questions about uh, fusion education, whether in Europe or outside, please do have a look at our website or do just get in touch directly. Um, if you want someone to come into your school or college, from your local university and you can't get hold of someone, um, please don't hesitate to ask. And we have a bank of contacts you might be able to help. The worst that can happen is that someone, you know, that someone says no and they don't have the time. But if you want support in fusion education, please, I mean, please do get in touch with your local people who are local to you, but certainly please do get in touch with us and we're very happy to help in, um, in any way we can. Um, anyway, two of the recent initiatives from FuseNet um, are, are in the first two sessions, um, either side of a coffee break today. Um, we've Over the last few years, we've developed some um, classroom materials for use in, in um, secondary schools um, and, and high schools, whatever terminology we want to use. And we've also, uh, and this is more recent, this is just in the last year, in the last few months, um, we've also developed and released a um, uh, an educational video. So it's my, I want to say massive thank you to all of you teachers um, and instructors who've come along today, who've given up time from your working week to come and, and listen and engage with us. Please, if I say one thing today, please don't let today be the end of your engagement with us. Please continue and stay in touch. But it's my great pleasure to hand over to Sander, um, who is going to uh, present our classroom material package. Sander, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, thanks for the nice introductory talk. I'll share my presentation and then we'll dive right in.
so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, by the way, there's also a Q&A uh, button. So there you can ask questions and there's pe people also looking at the Q&A to answer them in the meantime. Uh, of course, after the presentation, there will also be room for questions. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah, so my name is Sander Korteweg. I've been uh, working on the classroom materials uh, of FuseNet for secondary schools for the past couple of years. And um, as, yeah, so as you will see today, uh, I will give an overview of the educational modules that are now available, where to download them and highlights from each of the modules. Uh, and our goal is that from this day on, you get uh, five ready to use lessons on nuclear fusion. Um, so the modules, uh, they're for secondary schools, there's five, they're all focused on nuclear fusion, but each one has a, a bit of a different area of focus. So the first one is fusion basics, which just really explains what fusion is, how it works, and, and goes into the basics of the physics. Then the second one is called road to fusion, in which we also look at it from a historical perspective. So we start out with, well, how did the field of fusion start? What were the first devices? How did, did it go over the years? How did it progress? And we end uh, at the, the current installation at, at, at the ITER machine that uh, well is nearing its completion uh, in the, the coming years. Uh, the third module is about plasma control. Uh, so once we have a reactor, we do need to control the, the, the plasma. We need to control the reaction, make sure that everything works as is. Uh, so this module really dives into a basic of control th theory and how do we control a, a plasma. The fourth module is on fusion materials, which is also a very booming uh, area of research. For fusion, we of course need very, uh, well, materials that are able to handle a lot. They need to handle a high uh, energy, high neutron flux, etc. So that, that is also very interesting. What do we need to, to be able to contain such a hot plasma? And the fifth one, uh, we look at fusion more from an energy systems perspective. So we look really at the deployment of fusion because how will it fit in the future energy system and what needs to be done to make sure that fusion becomes a really a viable uh, energy source. So with those five uh, modules, our goal was to uh, give a complete overview of fusion. Well, you of course can't give a full complete overview of an entire field, but we hope that with these five modules, uh, a lot of different areas of fusion uh, can be treated in, in a classroom setting. Um, so all of the modules, they, they are modular in nature. So we set them up in the following way. That the first module is really uh, used to introduce all the necessary concepts to, to give the basics of fusion. And all of the other four modules can be followed in any order. So they're self-sufficient. They, uh, if you have time for uh, two hours in class, you can give one hour on the fusion basics and you can pick one of the modules that you're most interested in or that aligns best with your uh, school curriculum. On the other hand, you, of course, are always welcome to do all of them uh, and each one complements each other. So the setup of each module, uh, each module consists of a student reader, which is kind of the, the, the workbook. Uh, which contains all the content, all the information, uh, the exercises, uh, and can be used by the students. Then we have presentation slides, which are available both in PowerPoint and in PDF format. So these slides can be adapted completely to your preferences uh, and well, used any way you like. But we, we've tried to uh, give you a ready-to-use presentation that you can just adapt to your preferences and then easily give a presentation on uh, each module. Then there's a teacher's manual in which uh, we, we list a lot of, of content of the module and what is uh, relevant information, what topics might be good to combine with the module, uh, and also give some, some basic lesson schemes. Uh, and there's additional exercises. So some exercises listed or ranked in difficulty that you can give as homework or, or uh, give to, to some students that want some extra challenge. So first, We'll discuss where to find the modules. And as Roddy already mentioned, uh, the FuseNet website is, is where we have published them. So if you go to the FuseNet website, that will look like this. And you see the tabs in the, in the top of the page. Under education, you can go to educational materials. And if you click on there, you'll go to the educational materials browser, uh, of which you see the top of the page here. And there you can see 
five tiles with uh, the modules. If you click on one of those tiles, you'll find the module in a downloadable shape. Uh, if you were to scroll down on this page, you would also see the complete educational materials browser, uh, in which we have all sorts of educational materials. So books, multimedia, uh, experiments, uh, material for educators, such, such as the, the uh, learning modules, uh, also teacher day recordings, everything we have can be found online. And this page is curated by FuseNet and it has, uh, well, a lot of content for varying levels of education. So uh, there's also a lot on there that is for PhD or master level. Uh, that might be interesting if you want to, to uh, do a deep dive and, and go a bit deeper in fusion. Uh, but there's also the content such as the educational modules for secondary school, uh, soon also for primary school and more. So when you're in the educational materials browser and you click on one of the tiles of the modules, uh, this is what you see. So you get some information on the module, uh, you get a link from which to download the PowerPoint slides and the documents, which are version numbered. So if there's mistakes, then we uh, will fix those and then they will be updated over time. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, it's of course nicest to discuss what each module looks like and what, what the content is. So now I'm first going to give a full overview of, of one module, of module one, and then we're going to go through some highlights from all of the modules so that at the end you will have a good uh, overview of what each model, module entails. So module one is the student reader has about 40 pages and we've divided it into five chapters. So we first start, start out by talking about energy, what the role is uh, in, a, in our world. Um, and then we go on to the, the sun because the sun is, is, well, it drives on fusion. So how does fusion work inside of our sun? And from there, we, we go forward to how would we replicate that on earth? And for that, we need a plasma, which is a term, of course, most people know from, from just popular things like movies and, and literature. Um, but what really is a plasma? Uh, is treated in that chapter. And then the final chapter is really building a fusion device. So how do we build a fusion device on Earth? We need to do some way of confining all that heat. Uh, we focus on magnetic confinement because that is also the focus of the European research framework. Uh, so how do we magnetically confine a plasma so that we can achieve fusion? Uh, each, each module also has further reading, which uh, lists some links or uh, articles that could also be of use to read, uh, contain some interesting information on the topic. So how does that look such a student reader? This is uh, the first chapter of the first module. As you can see, there's text, we have some highlighted keywords, and we also have, uh, so this, this, uh, let me bring a laser pointer in here. So this orange block here, the, the colors vary per module, gives a bit of extra information. Uh, that can be skipped if necessary, but can also be treated for some extra info. So what we also have in each module, which you can see here on the, the bottom left, uh, are classroom exercises. So these are a bit sh shorter exercises that can either lead to a classroom discussion or should be able to be finished in a couple of minutes or might uh, require students to look something up on the internet, um, which can be made a part of the lesson and uh, fit in, in the uh, storyline of the module. So that was the student reader in, in a brief uh, overview. Uh, each module also has the presentation slides. Um, so they really are free to adapt. So you can use them any way you like. Uh, and to give some examples here, we have a slide in which we explain how, how an atom looks like, what it's built up of protons, neutrons. Um, here we have an example slide of module one that, that shows the, the geometry of a, a torus, which is a very important shape in, in the field of fusion, as all tokamaks are, are donut sh shaped. Um, then the teacher's manual. Uh, so it contains learning objectives, uh, topics per chapter, a summary of the entire module, some lesson schemes, links, further reading material, more, and also solutions to the assignments. So that looks something like this. 
uh, here you can see learning objectives. You can see that, for instance, atomic physics, electricity, and magnetism are topics that are closely related to module one. Uh, for the first chapter, you can see we'll, we'll talk about energy, about climate change, what are the causes, etc. Um, introductory lesson uh, scheme. Here is an example of a 50 minute lesson scheme. All modules feature at least one 15 minute and one one hour le basic lesson scheme. Uh, which you can also adapt uh, however you like. Uh, but this gives you a, a bit of a basis that, that might uh, yeah, make it a bit easier to, to use the lesson. Uh, and of course, quite important are the solutions to exercises, which are quite useful if you uh, give an exercise in class and that the answers are readily available to you. Um, so the additional exercises are ranked in difficulty. They, they look something like this. Um, we've uh, ranked them with one or more stars. Uh, one star is not that difficult. Three stars is quite difficult. Uh, so you can use these as, as additional homework exercises. Um, so in conclusion, we have one full module with a student reader, a teacher's manual, additional exercises, and presentation slides. And of course, we have that for five modules. So. Now, module two, Road to Fusion, it's a bit shorter than the first one. It has 36 pages. And we start off with really the discovery of fusion. So Arthur Eddington uh, discovered the process of nu nuclear fusion. Then we go over first devices in the field of fusion, uh, a period in history of, of breakthroughs and also breakdowns. Uh, and we end up with ITER, which is well, really current day happening uh, and is nearing its completion. And to give you an example of how a page from module two looks, uh, here you see one in which you, you can see the older uh, classic uh, pinch device uh, from the UK, uh, Zeta, uh, and also an aside on instabilities. Um, another example here, uh, well, we have Tokamaks, we have Stellarators. Uh, the Stellarators are, are even a little bit older. Uh, and here's an example of, of how uh, an early version of a Stellarator, which had a very uh, nice figure eight uh, worked and why that it worked, uh, along with a picture of, of Lyman Spitzer, who was the, well, the father of the Stellarators. Um, and here, here you see an additional picture of that. So this one also has 37 slides that you can use. Um, and to give a couple of examples of how these slides work. So since we have a bit of a historical perspective for this module, it's not just about the physics, it's also a bit about politics and history. So the Cold War played an important part in, in the, uh, the ITER project in, in making sure that it happened in first forming the INTOR project, uh, which later became ITER. Uh, so that's also something that, that is part of the module. Uh, and here uh, is an example of a classroom exercise. And I, I think this might, uh, might be a nice one to, to uh, do because this one, well, you don't need to look things up. You can make an educated guess on this. Uh, so ITER is, is quite big, um, but how big? Well, it is 830 cubic meters. Uh, so this is one of the classroom exercises that's quite quick. So how many humans of 65 liter can fit in ITER or how about elephants? So it might be nice to hear your guesses of how many humans or elephants fit inside of ITER. I think you can put your answers in the chat. Although I at the moment don't see the chat. Uh, there is no chat, they can share them. Ah, there's no chat. Then, well, then I'll just continue with the answer. And they can say it in the Q&A. Can I say it in the Q&A? They can. They can. Ah, they can say it. OK, so there's no chat, but you can uh, put an answer in the Q&A. 2,500 people is the first guess. And if you agree, you can write the question. 12,000, that is a bit bigger. And uh, I do have to say also a bit, bit nearer. Um, that's the people. Any guesses on how many elephants there fit inside of Eater? Eighty. Eighteen. That's it. Well, I, I see a lot of guesses and you're all uh, quite close. 
So the answer to this is about 1200 humans and about 18 elephants. I do have to give one small remark on the amount of humans. We, we did not, we just calculated the volume. And, and so it is an optimal fit of let's push, push as many humans inside of ether as we can and not think about whether that's really realistically feasible. Um, but it, it gives a nice, nice example of how big ether really is. Um, so then on to the third module uh, about plasma control. Uh, so there we also have five chapters. The first one is really an introduction to control. Uh, so how does a thermostat work? How do you control anything? And then how do we apply that in fusion? And there's many fusion applica applications for control. So we mainly focus on, on really uh, one important uh, quantity, namely the plasma temperature. So how do we heat the plasma and how do we measure the temperature of that plasma, uh, which is a really interesting topic uh, that yeah gives a good insight into how we control such a big and complex device. And in the end, we, we give a conclusion on, on uh, not just plasma temperature, but also all the other quant quantities that are measured in uh, fusion. Uh, so to give an example here, you see uh, the student reader with uh, an aside on, some, on feedback, what feedback is. Uh, what a controller is, basic control scheme with feedback, sensors, actuator, actuators. And here we see uh, the chapter on heating the plasma, in which we, well, we have a couple of ways of heating plasma, uh, either injecting some, some electromagnetic waves, or we just inject hot particles, or we uh, use ohmic heating, in which we have a, a, a current through a wire and the wire heats up. And they, those three uh, principles are also really used in fusion. Uh, and of course, there's also the alpha particle heating, which you can see on the side here, in which the fusion, uh, well, is going to start heating itself, which is really interesting and, and uh, very important for future fusion devices. So here we have 21 slides, uh, in which we, for example, look at uh, injecting hot particles, uh, neutral beam injection. Um, also, we discussed the global versus local measurements. So we have an average temperature, but of course the temperature is not the same. We need the temperature to be high in the core, but well, we like it to be as low as possible at the edge because otherwise it's a bit more difficult to build a machine that can hold it. Um, so with that said, we'll head on to module four, which is on materials. Uh, so with module four, there's one additional remark. Module four does not have additional exercises, but while making the module, we, we had a lot of extra material, which we are making into a, an additional annex, um, which is coming soon. So uh, we have not treated superconductivity in detail in module four, but we will release an additional part that will focus purely on superconductivity. Uh, so the first chapter of module four really focuses on the material requirements. So we, we need really extreme materials because of the extreme settings. Uh, the heat exhaust problem is a very important one, uh, making sure that we have a diverter that works, that can handle all the heat loads. Uh, of course, in fusion, we also have a lot of neutrons flying around, and those really damage the materials. So neutron irradiation is also a very important topic. And then finally, the, the blanket uh, that is built kind of around the fusion uh, uh, vessel to, to capture the neutrons and make sure that we have a, a working fuel cycle, which is also really crucial for uh, fusion to, to work. So to give a couple of examples here, here you see uh, two images of the, uh, well, one image of the ether device and one uh, conceptual image of, of what the first wall is, the diverter, where the blanket lies. And here you see, uh, uh, a page in which we really list the material requirements for the plasma facing com components, PFCs, uh, such as tritium compatibility, uh, high thermal conductivity, and also we look at different materials. So why do we choose certain materials for certain parts of the machine? Uh, which is also what you can see over here. Here you have a, a quick overview, of all the different colors of different material. And this is an image of the, the JET, the Joint European Taurus in the UK. So here we have 38 slides, also all available 
and uh, well, we really look into two, we focus on the two parts, the internal reactor walls and the blanket. Uh, and we also have some material science introductions in there because yeah, we, we to look at the materials, we also need to look at why some materials work better than others. Uh, so why do we use all these metals? How are they built up uh, with grains and grain boundaries? Then the final module is module five uh, on deployment. So uh, the other modules are a bit more, more physics based and the fifth module really focuses on how does it all fit. Uh, we have, uh, we want to have fusion power, at least a lot of people are working on that. But when we look at the energy system, how does it fit in there? Uh, in the future, we, we expect that the, the demand and supply of energy is gonna change quite a lot. Um, and we need to know how does fusion add to the mix? And also very important, what about the money? So will fusion energy be affordable? Will it be cheap uh, or will it be really expensive? Those are all factors that really uh, are important for fusion to become an energy source of the future. Uh, and we also discuss how fusion might become cheaper and then have an outlook on, well, not just ITER, but also onwards, what comes after ITER. So there's uh, in Europe, there's already a roadmap for, well, up until uh, I think 2050, 2070, uh, with a couple of devices planned. So to give a couple of examples from this student reader, here you see an image in which we, we look at the percentage of, of uh, electricity and energy and how much of it is, is created or generated by fossil fuels, um, which unfortunately, unfortunately there's still a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, but we also look at how, how much does one household uh, consume per year? How much does a city consume? How much does uh, an average wind turbine generate? How much would a fusion power plant or a fission power plant generate? So this is all to help it put into perspective. How does energy work for our entire world? And also what are the costs? So which one is more expensive than the other? What, what, what are the things that uh, we need to have a look at when we decide which energy sources we need for the future? Um, and also what are the costs of really one fusion device. So fusion has a lot of capital costs. So there's a lot of buildings that need to be made, uh, which all, all factor in to the equation when we decide how much is it gonna be to cost uh, to build one. So with presentations, uh, slides here, we have a couple of examples. For instance, we talk about land use, uh, which varies a lot per energy source uh, with a wind turbine or solar panels or a fission plant. And also about repairments, which is something uh, that needs to be done in a fusion reactor. And well, as you can see here on the pictures, that is all done remotely, which uh, with robots because of the radioactivity inside a working fusion reactor. So then, so far I've shown you all uh, well, only English modules. So our aim was, and, and still kind of is, to translate the modules into many different European languages. Uh, but this is not going to be uh, headed by the, or at least we are going to be coordinating this. Uh, but since uh, we do not have native speakers from all countries, we cannot really translate them all. So here we really need help from, from people that want to translate the materials. So are you interested in helping out with this? Uh, send us an email. And I can already tell you that there's uh, two translations currently underway, uh, one in Catalan and one in Dutch. Um, of, of module one and the other modules are hopefully to follow in the future. Uh, so the aim is to eventually have a lot of, of these modules in different languages, but we do need your help to make sure that we can get those translated. So send us an email if you want to help out with that. So to give a bit of a summary, so far we've seen an overview of the educational modules, where to download them uh, and highlights from each module. Uh, so again, where you can find them, fusenet.eu slash education slash material. Or if you just go to the Fusenet website, you can find it uh, under education and then in the educational materials browser. So I also want to have a really brief moment to acknowledge all the people that have worked on these modules over the past three years, uh, which is the Fusenet educational materials team, uh, Arno Klaassen for module two, Michael Fodain for module three, and module five, Simone Mingotzi for module four, Bas Marischal for module five, Shauki Tijmens and Hoekstra for uh, really the support and, and uh, teachers' insight 
for all of the modules and Jens made a Frankemühle also for module five uh, and also as the editor who made all these modules look so good uh, again Jens Peter Frankemühle and also from the FuseNet executive office Mira van Nunen, Jens Peter Frankemühle, Dario Cruz and Guido Lange for the uh, support over the past three years with this project and also for the proofreaders which is uh, which are Nick Lopez Cardozo, Roger Jaspers, Paolo Ricci and Nick Osborne. So with that I would like to open the floor for questions. Um, so if you have any questions please feel free to put them in the chat um, and thank you very much for your attention. think uh, so if you have any questions please put them in the q a and uh, yeah so uh, also uh, important so if you use the modules we're of course very interested to hear your feedback uh, so you can send that to feo at fusenet.eu uh, where f a f e o stands for fusenet executive office um, a question you mentioned plans through to 2070. Is there a chance of getting fusion electricity before then? Uh, I, I think for that question, I, I might refer back to Roddy, who is uh, much more expertly in that than I am. He's not here. Ah, he's not here anymore. Um, then uh, I think the, the hope, of course, is that it will be earlier. Uh, and there's a lot happening currently. So there's also a lot of startups that are trying to accelerate the pathway to fusion. I think for um, well, well, we'll see presentations from W7X and from ITER uh, next up on the, uh, during this, this uh, global session. Uh, so in there, we will also hear, hear a lot about what is going on there. Uh, but ITER is planned to be ready, if I recall correctly, in December 2025. Then it will have experiments for at least 10 years until it is up to full speed. So then we're at 2035. And I think the the demo, the next step of ITER uh, will probably be uh, starting construction, hopefully earlier than that, but I don't know for sure what the timeline is for that. Um, a good addition to the, yes, that is true. Uh, could we contact you and your team to ask questions? Yes, so if there's any questions on the modules or on anything related to the modules, or if, if you are interested in, in anything fusion related on secondary school level uh, or or higher level or lower level uh, you can contact uh, the uh, fusenet executive office and i don't know whether i can put the email address in the chat somehow um, but yeah it is uh, feo which is the abbreviation for fusenet executive office at fusenet.eu and if you send any email to, to Derek, and we will answer your questions and get back to you. Uh, I see the question, where will critical information be found? Uh, could you clarify the question? Ah, and what is the basic knowledge that you expect students to have in order to understand these topics? So, uh, the first mo module is the most accessible because it, it has the, the lowest level, so to say. And with the knowledge of the first module, students should be able to uh, finish all the other modules. Uh, so module one is, is made with uh, the is, is set ISCED uh, level three to four, which corresponds to secondary school students between 15 and 18 years old. So the first module is also said it, it should be understandable for a 16 year old secondary schooler with a little bit of physics background. Um, and all the other modules should as well. Of course, there, there might be some parts of the module that are a bit more advanced. We've tried to keep those, uh, for example, to the additional exercises that we've done list that's more difficult, uh, which can be used to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, but depending on the level of the students, uh, we've for instance, uh, at times given different uh, lesson schemes, because for 
uh, a 16 year old secondary schooler or an 18 year old secondary schooler there's a bit of a difference in level so you can dive a bit deeper in discussions uh, but the ground level of the modules should be accessible to all and uh, exactly will be information about the actual technical status of fusion reactors i think for for the actual uh, for the actual technical status of fusion reactors, uh, it might be best to follow the ITER website, which is the, the well, the, the most up to date, the newest fusion reactor uh, in the world, and also the biggest one. Uh, so, if and also to look at, at uh, for instance, W7X, which is uh, the biggest stellarator in the world, which is in in uh, the northeast part of Germany. Uh, so, the IPP, uh, which is the Institute of Plasma Physics in Germany. Uh, will have a website where they up, give updates on the, the status of their current device. And I think the ETO website is also a very good place to find information about that. Uh, critical information about the realization dangers. Um, I, I think um, module five is a very good place to, to look at those where we discuss uh, yeah, how will fusion, uh, how will it happen? Will it be able to, to be deployed? What are the, the risks, the advantages, etc.? cetera? Um, and the last question that I see, oh wait, there's two last questions. So the, the, is it possible for school classes to visit ITER and get guided tour? Yes, it definitely is possible. Um, that is also something you, you can contact ITER directly, um, but they have done guided tours in the past. Uh, so I, I think uh, if you contact them, uh, they, they should be able to help you out. Um, and the final question is related to purely the Dutch Teachers Association. Uh, I think it would be best if you send, send us an email, uh, then uh, we'll have a look at that. And I, I think... Uh, we can uh, definitely discuss that. Good afternoon. Um, welcome back to the uh, global session of the FuseNet Teacher Day. Um, our next speaker is the executive officer of uh, FuseNet, uh, Dario Cruz. He uh, has some cool videos to show you uh, and I will give the word to him. Thank you very much, Sander. Uh, good afternoon, dear old teachers. Uh, well, thanks for joining our event and staying with us uh, so far. So I hope you had a good uh, coffee break. So yeah, I would like to to start this this uh, session with the, the afternoon session with the presentation of uh, our educational video. So yes. So what is the motivation behind us uh, creating this this video? Well, Fusion decided to produce a video explaining the development of nuclear fusion as a future energy source. This has a reason. This is because we know we have, there is available already some very nice videos uh, on fusion uh, on, on YouTube and the different platforms. But we noticed that these videos are always uh, focusing on a really specific topic or certain specific topics. But we identified that there is a lack of a video that would provide like a proper guideline to the fusion topics, that's a video that could be used uh, as a basic video, as an as, as actually as an educational tool for for students uh, and for teachers and for people to learn about fusion. So we identified that there was this lack of, of material available online, and then that's why we decided to 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 create this our, our own video that uh, that would that would address this particular topic. So of course. Uh, since we already have the educational materials, we would like also this video to reach a particular audience. So this audience for us is uh, of the secondary school uh, students. So students from the upper level of, of secondary school, students that already have some, some uh, basic physics content uh, and concepts, and uh, some, some, the students that would really grasp the, the, the basic concepts that we want to, to, to show of, uh, in this video about fusion. So because of this, and because this is our audience, uh, we we chose a, a short uh, format for the video. So it's around 30 minutes, 
because we really want this video to be included in in the European education curriculum. So your curriculum, we want you to use this this video as a tool also for your lessons if you're interested in showing a little bit of us fusion. Uh, and of course, we are not expert uh, filmers, so <laughs> filmmakers. So we uh, we launched a call, and then this project was awarded to a UK filming company, Polar Media. So we knew Polar Media from before because they are a filming company that they have already done some uh, nice videos with Ether. So they are known to the fusion world, and they are really good at telling a story and 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 in embedding these fusion con concepts into a into a very nice story storytelling video. So, so th that's why they got the, the award of the call. And then with the, the, the overall scheme of the video, we wanted to provide accurate physics background on a general and visual explanation. And let me, let me tell a little bit more about that. What, what does it mean? So we know that this video is for uh, secondary school students. So we really don't want to make the concepts really complicated. So we want to, to, to explain the concepts in a really basic and understandable way. But we also are aware that if you simplify too much the physics, sometimes then you lose track of the physics it, itself. And then you may start saying something that is not physically accurate. But then the other thing is that if you overcomplicate things, and then if you really want to tell all the physics behind it, then you actually lose uh, sight of the content. And then you start really uh, like uh, losing the audience and just getting into really specific topic. So we were aware of this thing and we really wanted to make a compromise be between it. Uh, how do we do it? Well, first of all, you will see that in the video, we have uh, the speakers are all people involved in fusion. So there are uh, researchers, there are also educators. Actually, there is a uh, Roddy, Roddy who did the, <laughs> the introduction part and myself, we are also part of the contributors of this video. So we really chose the, fu the fusion people to tell the story and also us from Fusionet after the video was done, we made some final edi editing of the video and revision to see that the concepts were nicely explained on a basic level, but that they were accurately, physically accurate. So you could use this safely as an education tool because we're really, aware that uh, you need to provide the right information to your students and you need to, to tell them the, the, the real physics behind it and not some, some concept that may be misunderstood because that takes a toll on, 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 the, on the future education. So let me, let me start by showing you a little bit of a clip. We, we made several clips of the video. Okay, so uh, in, this, in this video, what are the topics that we wanted to touch? Not into detail, but, but we would, like I said, we want to have a guideline on this video. So what were the topics that, that we wanted to touch? So first of all, what is fusion energy? So what is the physics behind the reaction and the plasmas and what is all uh, what, what entails all of these entails? Then how does fusion work? How is it that we from fusion are willing to create uh, electricity that is gonna be provided to the grid? There, of course, what are the properties and advantages of fusion energy? Well, we're gonna uh, mention about fuel supply, the waste, the safety features of a fusion reactor. Also, we are uh, uh, mentioning what are, at what point are we with the, with the fusion energy development? So how is it going? Like you, some of you mentioned the question like, hey, but what is the timeline to, to 2050? What is how it's going on? So we touch also those topics. What are the key challenges to deliver fusion energy to the electrical grid? So Sandra already mentioned the educational materials, something about the, the, the the challenges for materials, but also we're going to mention some turbulence, uh, problems with engineer, management, time. But since this is a this is a, a video um, focused on students, there are also some some questions uh, I, that students may ask that we want to address. So, for example, what could a student do in order to help realizing the fusion uh, electricity? In the world, so for example, we mentioned about how to, what studies to to follow, career opportunities. So this is also involved, and then we will end on how fusion energy will will fit into a future global energy mix. Yeah. Okay. So what about what about the distribution, distribution of this video? Well, this video is already available to the public. So this video, we put it on our uh, YouTube channel. This is already available for you. Uh, and I just want to let you know that this is free to use during your lessons and educational activities. You are entitled to use this video in the way possible. 
The only thing we would ask you to do is if you use it, just please give some credit to Fusion and men mention the association. So it's not that we're gonna charge you for it or anything, this is free educational material, but we, we would like you to mention that you took this material from Fusion, that Fusion exists because we want also the students to be aware that there is a European association that deals with Fusion education and that they also can contact us uh, to, to if they want to pursue a career in Fusion, if they want to continue on this path, well, we they can contact us and 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 we can we can we can guide them or, or we can we can support them. So yeah, so this is the the reason why we would like you to to if you use our materials just to mention that the, there's fusion it and, and a little bit on what we do. So this is the only thing we ask. Of course, this video is we would like it to be complementary to the educational material that Sander already mentioned and 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 show to you. So I think this this combination of the educational materials and the and the educational video, I think it's it's it makes like a good uh, resource for you teachers to actually show how fusion is, uh, and what fusion uh, how fusion can be uh, can be easily explained to the to the students with with good available resource, and we would like you to watch to to spread the knowledge of this of this video as much as you can. You have a really vast network of colleagues and students with you, and this is the people we want to reach with our materials. So we are really happy if you if you uh, make a widespread distribution of, of this of this uh, video uh, among your among your network. We can also uh, use another computer to show the videos. That would be good. So we we'll switch to a different shared screen, and then uh -huh. we will be able to show the rest of the video. That sounds good. Thank you. So we will at the end we will be able to to send you the to show you the the trailers. But in the meantime, while we finish, because this is my last slide, and maybe we show you the oh. trailers, because I will I, I've been talking about this video, and probably you should see a clip, but we will show you at the end. So the, as I mentioned, this video is really available, already available. So what is the title of this video? Well, this is this is the one you see there. So in YouTube, you can find it as the easiest thing nature does: an introduction to fusion energy. I just attached the QR code there. So if you take your phone and you scan it with your camera, this QR code will lead you directly to the YouTube link. And then you will see the full video there. But also I I included the, the address below. So if you want to, to, to save it as well. So let, let's see if we can uh, work with the technology here and show you the, the video clips. So let's see, give me one sec. Shall I stop sharing? Yes. Hydrogen is isotopes are deuterium with one proton and one neutron yep. and tritium with one proton and two neutrons. So they collide with a very high energy and temperature around 150 million degrees, which is 10 times higher temperature than in the center of the sun. And they can fuse. So we have helium element and we have one neutron. So this is the most important part of the reaction because neutron takes 80% of all. Over the development of the past decades, two concepts have basically survived this Darwinistic process, and that's the tokamak and the stellarator. And both have in common that the magnetic field is ring-shaped. But there's, there are subtle differences between tokamak and stellarator, not just the name. Now, tokamak is a Russian word, and essentially it just means a donut. That, that is not exactly what, that is not what Rus Russian for donut is, but a tokamak is essentially a donut-shaped chamber. So a tokamak is a Russian acronym and uh, it means just in Russian language, um, toroidal chamber and magnets. So it's very, very straightforward. And so it has nothing to do with the tomahawk. Never, never confuse that. Over the develop... It turns out we need strong magnetic fields. So we actually need uh, two types of magnetic field. Uh, the first one happens in what we call the toroidal direction. This is following the shape of the torus around. But that wouldn't be quite enough to keep it completely confined. So what we do is we actually want a magnetic field as well in what we call the poloidal direction. And that sort of introduces a twist.
Well, those those were the, the video clips that were supposed to, to be shown during the during the the presentation. But I'm glad that we managed to to show them to you. So this is the this is the idea behind the video. You can see how how it is structured. So I would really encourage you to go have a look. Also, please give us some feedback because we are always happy to hear from you. What do you think of the video? What uh, what are your impressions? Is it is it okay for for the level and is it useful for you? To, to show to the students during the, during your classes. So yeah, we're really happy to hear any feedback from you and uh, also really happy to be able to, to make this material available for you to use during, during your, your lessons. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Dario, for the presentation and uh, the cool clips. Uh, our next speaker uh, hasn't arrived yet, so I, th I think we'll wait a minute or so. Uh, she should join any moment, and otherwise we'll, we'll switch out uh, to parts of the uh, well, the two next parts. So, ah, as I speak, uh, we can welcome Sabina Griffith. Hi, Sabina. Uh, good that you're here. Here I am. Ah, hello. Just in time. Um, I uh, yeah would then like to introduce Sabina Griffith, uh, who is working at ITER, is also a FuseNet board member, and uh, yeah, sh she is the person that can tell us all about ITER and show us all the cool things that are happening right now in the south of France at the forefront of fusion. Uh, so Sabina, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Sander. Um, yes, welcome everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you at ITER. Unfortunately, like uh, compared to last year when we were able to take you live into the Tokamak uh, and the Tokamak Hall, um, we are sort of victims of the success of ITER. Um, we are just flooded with requests from media and visitors. So all my colleagues are out there now and um, taking people around and showing them where we are at, what we are doing at ITER. So um, I will nevertheless explain to you what we do here. And I have some very recent slides and um, a little video clip also that will show you where we are at. And then afterwards, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to share the um, to take some questions from you. So let me just start my presentation. So ITER is the Latin way for the, uh, the way and the former days it was called the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. But a lot of people didn't like the work, word thermonuclear in there because it reminded us of some bad times. And uh, so we prefer the way, the way towards new energy. We started ITER in 2006. And as you can see on this image, which is a recent drone picture, we have made a little progress since then. But let me go back in time. There have been many, many uh, fusion machines built over the past 60, 70 years, larger ones, smaller ones, very different technologies, the tokamaks, the stellarators, the laser devices, the linear devices, you name them. And there was big progress made, especially in Russia and the United States and in the UK. And there was then a time, and Fusion was absolutely classified. And I'm saying that because at the moment we here at ITER, we get a lot of questions about our Russian partner. Russia has always been and will remain a partner in the ITER project. And I can take questions on that later. So, but Fusion was classified for a long time and the East was not supposed to share information with the West and vice versa. But everybody uh, behind the scenes, everybody was closely connected. But everybody knew also realized very soon that it was not so much about the financial resources, but the intellectual resources um, that they should really join forces and move together. So it was then in 1985 uh, at the Superpower Summit in Geneva where 
the then world leaders, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, they met and they discussed the world peace and how to overcome the big divide. But at the end of the meeting, they also mentioned and discussed something which is called the ITER project. And as I said before, they saw the necessity uh, or the fusion community had spoken to them and they saw the necessity to move together and to come up with a, with a joint program for the benefit of all mankind and to find a way and to pave the way for research for a new source of clean energy. And uh, it took a few years to get uh, the paperwork done and to assemble more nations around the ITER negotiation table. And in 2006, on the 21st of November, seven, the representatives of seven nations, well, or members, because one member is the European Commission, they came together at the Elysee Palace in Paris uh, and they signed the ITER agreement for the pursuit of fusion energy research. Today, ITER is the largest international scientific collaboration in the world. We have 35 members joined under the ITER flag and they're all investing and their financial resources, their industrial resources and their intellectual resources to take fusion energy to the commercial stage to prove that we can do it. Here is ITER's course mission to show the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion, that we have the materials, that we have the understanding of how, how to harness the sun in a fusion bottle, to, because we are really dealing with mother nature's brutal forces here. So, but the promise of clean fusion energy is so immense that um, again, we have 35 nations gathered here. The goal is to show a burning plasma that one day we, can, we need a lot of heating uh, power to start the fusion reaction. Uh, so the Q bigger equals 10 is the uh, multiplication amplification uh, equation with 50 megawatts of heating power. We have to at least achieve 500 megawatts of thermal output power. So this is the ultimate physical goal of ITER. Plus, we want to come to what's called a burning plasma, that the self-heating of the atoms uh, uh, is so good and so high that we literally can turn off the external heating devices. We also have to prove the tritium breeding. We will get some tritium from Canada, from so-called uh, heavy water reactors, to launch the uh, fusion reaction in there. But if we really want to deploy fusion devices all around the world, we have to show that we can breed the tritium, which is one of the uh, fusion fuels in a tokamak. I'm just running through here, so please forgive me. Uh, I only have 30 minutes and I do want to take your questions. All of what I'm saying here can be um, read and seen on our website. Um, all the information you can imagine should be there, I hope. La Machina, the machine, is a tokamak. Um, there are many, many different roads to fusion energy. There are, as I said before, there are many different technologies. Um, for ITER, they decided to use the tokamak principle. Um, it is the principle for which we have the most solid database. It's the most advanced fusion technology. Um, it has its downsides because it always it will always operate in a pulsed operation uh, in contrary to a stellarator then the Stellarator has the disadvantage that they are very, very difficult to manufacture and to build. So we will see. Um, the race is definitely on. We currently have more than 60 fusion projects around the world, many of them in private uh, or financed by private money. Uh, the bigger ones are, are publicly funded. ITER is 100% funded by governments, which um, we would love to see some private money coming in. There are a lot of people knocking on our doors, but uh, the advantage of being in government's hands is that we are not tangible to any sort of um, economic uh, economical forces, you know, return of investments and what else there is. 
So ITER will be the largest fusion device ever built. It is 10 times larger than the currently existing one, the JET facility. Uh, why is that so? Because fusion is also a, si a matter of size. We need a large burning chamber to have enough fusion reactions there to really have a net energy gain, net energy output. ITER is a real heavy weight. It, in total, it will weigh 23,000 tons. And that alone is a big challenge to put this together and to keep it on the ground and safe and stable. The machine is made of out of many, many, many components, larger ones, smaller ones. The smaller ones are not necessarily less important, but I'm just uh, putting my hands here on two key features, if you want to say so. One is the vacuum vessel, which is our burning chamber. Uh, in the vacuum vessel, the actual fusion reaction will take place. This alone is um, or has been a large challenge for the worldwide steel industry. Um, the first uh, try, um, we designed a vacuum vessel. We handed over the blueprints to the industry. And I'm not talking to any industry. It's the real big players in the world. And they just shook their head and held their belly laughing there, uh, laughing. And so and they um, got back to us and said, well, have you ever spoken to industry before you uh, designed this? So we had to go back to the drawing table. We had big meetings. And so we had to learn the hard way that we cannot do these things without having the industry on board right from day number one. So um, we also need uh, a large magnetic cage and ITER is definitely pushing the frontier of magnet technology forward. We have a lot of people that have formerly worked at CERN on the Large Hadron Collider, and they have now joined here. So for ITER, we have, I think my um, predecessors, Dario and Sanus, they have already explained the tokamak concept. So we have this burning chamber, the vacuum chamber, which is sitting inside a magnetic cage. And this is the magnetic cage. It is um, mainly consisting out of a big central magnet, central solenoid, which is really the backbone of ITER, the largest and most powerful uh, magnet ever built. We have 18 toroidal field coils and six poloidal field coils. Four out of the six poloidal field coils are actually manufactured here on site and all the rest of these components are manufactured in the seven corners of this world. We also, the whole tokamak is sitting in this fridge, the cryostat, which keeps the magnets cool. The magnets are operating at minus 270 degrees. And so almost absolute zero uh, because they operate with um, classical or classic superconductors. Uh, and inside the vacuum vessel, we have temperatures of 150 million degrees. This is the temperature you need to make the atoms uh, fuse to overcome the Coulomb barrier. Um, so within a few meters from uh, the center of the plasma to the magnets, which is just six meters, five or six meters, you have temperatures hotter than in the core of the sun and colder than on the dark side of the moon. So we don't only have immense electromagnetic stresses on the components on the machine, but also heat stresses. So all this has to be taken care of. Um, and again, the cryostat is 100% uh, procurement from India. So it arrived here on site in different in small pieces. It was then welded together <clears throat> over eight years. It is done. Uh, and half of it is already inside the actual tokamak pit. This is where we assemble the machine. And the rest is still waiting. You will see this in the video at the end. So, and then once we have the machine, uh, we will inject our fusion fuel, which is a gas mixture made of out of uh, deuterium and tritium, so uh, hydrogen atoms. We then insert uh, a very strong current, and um, the current. Uh, Transfers uh, transforms the um, the gas into the fourth state of matter, which is a plasma. A plasma uh, is uh, tangible, feels 
the electromagnetic cage around it. So with the magnets, we squeeze the plasma like a donut, uh, like the jelly in a donut together to keep this plasma, again, 150 million degrees. There are no materials in this on this world that can withstand such temperatures. So we have to squeeze the plasma together to keep it away from the wall. And uh, squeezing also means that we have um, more collisions in um, in the in the plasma and so on the magnets also help us to stabilize the plasma to control its position if the plasma it's a living organ it's a it's a wild beast it's like the flares on the sun you know it wants to escape it wants to burst so uh, the the whole set of magnets helps us to control uh, the plasma we also have very sophisticated um gas injection systems and pellet injections to control disruptions and these flares in the plasma so it's a very complex scientific undertaking here so but the result of the fusion reaction gives us helium helium is interesting because it's an alpha particle it uh, serves as maintaining the, the 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 heat in the plasma or heating the plasma but what the world is after is this little guy n at the lower left side which is the neutron and the neutron as you saw in the little reel which dario showed from the film this is where 80 percent of the fusion energy goes and the neutron is neutral it escapes the electromagnetic cage and it hits the walls of our beautiful machine and there it is slowed down in the walls. We have cooling loops, water loops. Uh, it is, sorry, it's cooled down. It, it transfers its kinetic energy into heat energy. It heats up the water and then the water, the hot water goes to turbines and we produce gas and finally electricity. Now you can say, and you will not be the first ones that say, this is a, a pretty big and complex machine, quite expensive to produce hot air. Indeed it is, but it is the efficiency of this reaction that again calls 35 nations to action. And we will never have more than three to four grams of fuel inside the burning chamber at any time. And it's the efficiency of this reaction that is the big promise of fusion to deliberate us from fossil fuels. We have a big internal discussion here right now, whether we should call it limitless energy. I'm of the party that says we should never talk about limitless energy. There is no such thing. We always have to be aware that energy is something that we have to use with great care. Uh, but fusion certainly has the potential to take over a large, large fraction of the so-called base load power, which is currently provided by the fossil fuels. But we will see, we are not there yet. Uh, we are still in the assembly phase and there is still some, um, some way to go. But we are of course absolutely um, uh, positive and we believe that it can be done, that it will be done. It's just a matter of time. ITER is very unique in the way we are building it. So all these parties don't transfer money to our bank account and we then place the contracts with industry, no. ITER is built by in-kind contributions, and this is very unique in the science world and in projects of this kind. So we divided the whole ITER machine up into different um, components and um, yeah, parts, and the contribution, contributing nations, uh, you see them here. So we have China, all of Europe, India, um, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States, they all decided which part of the machine they want to contribute, whether it's uh, the cryolines, the diverters, the blankets, the modules, you name it. So, and um, they are building it. They had to qualify, the industry had to qualify for these contracts. So this was a long, long uh, teething process in the beginning. So. This caused a lot of delays because that was underestimated uh, how time consuming this was, the whole quality assurance in the factories out there. But um, there is a method in our madness doing it this way. Because while we are building ITER, um, we are creating a fusion industry all around the world. So we are 
setting up industry uh, knowledge. The industry is training young engineers and scientists uh, on the job. And here FuseNet plays a big role. They have this tool matchmaking with industry to really get the students right into contact with industry from the start. I mentioned that for a long time, fusion was sort of done on the in laboratories on the whiteboard, you know, but uh, with ITER, we have certainly entered the industrial era. So we need to interact and talk to industry right from the beginning. Here's an example, you see some key components and you see the flags of the nations that are contributing to these components. So sometimes one component has many, many fathers. So like the central solenoid, for example, the big magnet in the core, all the conductors in this big magnet come from Japan. The conductors have been shipped to General Atomics in San Diego, California. And it's at General Atomics where actually the magnet was built and we have already received three of the six modules that will make the central solenoid that are being stacked in our assembly hall. Here is a picture of where we were in the year 2015 on the left hand side and this on the right hand side is uh, the plant um, today. Um, a lot of people are surprised to see that ITER is that big. In the, in the center of the picture on the right, you see the big Tokoma complex. This is where the machine is taking shape. But we have more than 30 buildings in support uh, of ITER, like the power conversion buildings, the cryo plant, the cooling water plant, uh, the heating uh, devices, and so on, you name it, the big switch yard, you name it. 80% of the silver works are complete and the overall progress, you can read it here to first plasma is 78%. We have made huge progress since the year 2020 when we started machine assembly. Uh, unfortunately, then this little bug COVID hit us also. The ITER site was operating and open all the time. Um, but unfortunately, of course, some of our collaborators, providers, they faced uh, problems. You know, of all the embargoes, you know, a lot of European industry uh, came to a very sudden hold because um, the money flow was no longer allowed. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just currently talking about Russia. Sorry, I'm just mixing this up. So um, no, but uh, the industry was uh, definitely feeling uh, a lack of supply for our superconductors, computer electronics, and other raw materials, you know, to provide the components to ITER. Nevertheless, um, it is amazing to see, I've been with the project for 16 years, and it's amazing to see what happened over the past two years. And we produced a one minute little clip, which I want to show with you, uh, show to you, and then I'm open to take your questions. I hope this works now, Dario. Oh yeah, one slide more. We are open to visits. So I can only encourage you, as I said, we are flooded with visitors. We are very hardly at our office desk. So, but please, if you are, if, the, if you have the opportunity to come here to, we are north of Aix-en-Provence. Marseille is the nearest airport, Aix-en-Provence, the train station. Come here with your class, with your family, come alone. You have to see it yourself. You know, only then you will understand what is re really understand what is happening here. And we are open for visits from Monday morning until Friday evening. It is we have it, the instructions on our website, or you just contact ETA Communications, and we will pave the red carpet. There is no video in here or here. So okay, let's do it again. Sorry.
Okay, this is it. Let there be light. This is our goal. Here I am. Thank you very so much, if there, Sabine. You're welcome. If there are any questions, please. Yes, so the Q&A uh, is again where the questions are going to be asked. So mm -hmm. feel free to put your question in the Q&A and uh, Sabina will answer them live. Thank you, Arp. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, Michael Schmidt, Michael Schmidt, uh, Jennersdorf sounds... Um, certainly not. So 2025 is no longer an option for us. Uh, as I mentioned, um, COVID hit us and uh, the Russian war in Ukraine and I call it war um, does not make our life easier. We are receiving or waiting for major components for the ETA machine coming from Russia. And of course there were heavy negotiations or discussions here in the house, what to do about this. Um, my answer to this is we had to wage what to do. If we would have banned Russia from the project, which, which is not that easy because we are connected via intergovernmental contracts. Um, so you cannot just kick out a partner. It's not that easy. Um, what would have happened? I mean, would we have stopped Putin or would Putin have noticed? I doubt it. But the ITER project would have been dead because these uh, components have no backup. We would have to reproduce them from scratch and that would have cost us many, many years. So we have a new director general uh, as of this week. And next week we have uh, an advisory committee here that will look at the new projections. So stay tuned. There will certainly be delays, but I have to say, does it really matter? I mean, either or fusion will never be the short-term solution to the climate crisis, uh, cr climate crisis. This will have to be done by the renewables, but um, fusion has the potential to deliver um, at least on a commercial scale by uh, the mid of the century. So whether it takes two or three years longer for ITER to go into operation, we have to do this very, very carefully. We cannot afford that ITER is a failure. So sorry for that. Uh, can you give an estimate when Q bigger equals 10 is reached? Yes, this will be, uh, you know, we will have a staged approach for fusion. We will start with, um, with helium plasma and only at a later stage, we will come to the full DT fusion. And uh, the research plan says this will probably be in 35. So we will see. Oh. If you have time, how did you Sabina get involved in fusion eater as your life's work? Okay, uh, do you have time? <laughs> um, I have a physics background and uh, I then became a, a scientific journalist. And after 15 years, I, by coincidence, met people from the fusion community in Munich, in Garching. And I must say, I had never heard about fusion, not to say about ITER, and I got interested. And so long story short, soon after I moved to France and I joined the ITER project. And it's not only for me, but for many people here, it's the job of a lifetime. It's uncomparable, I would say. How many time takes a visit with a guide? It depends on you. We can have a normal tourist tour, which is roughly um, half an hour of introductory presentation or 45 minutes and then one hour tour, or you contact me and we can explore the whole day, it depends. We can adapt to the needs and wishes. Is it possible to not just visit ITER, but also to combine with some kind of teacher's training like CERN does? Absolutely, absolutely. So if you want to come with teachers, we can do that. We have done this in the past. Is the lithium also in the vacuum chamber? In the last talk, it was not really clear. Well, um, you know, we will, uh, the blankets I mentioned, the uh, neutrons will hit the blankets and for uh, producing the tritium, the tritium breeding, these blankets will be lined with lithium. So the neutron hits the lithium lining and sort of produces tritium in a 
quick way to explain. These are very, very heavy, high technology uh, breeders. So we have six different technologies that will be tested in ITER and that's how one of them at least will work. Um, what kind of groups do you host for a visit optimal size age? Um, anybody as of the age of 16, up to there's no age limit uh, on top, but you would have to walk. Wheelchairs are allowed in the visitor center, but not on site, unfortunately, because that's uh, it's a working construction site. So it's very difficult to move around on a wheelchair, but um, otherwise, Absolutely, go to our website on the landing page on the right, upper right, uh, there is an icon to the virtual tours. Um, the last virtual tour dates uh, from April, so it's a bit out of date, but inside uh, or outside at least, uh, not much has uh, changed inside in the uh, Tokama pit, yes. So, but we will have the next drone intervention delivering new virtual tours, um, I believe beginning of November. Okay. I think that were the questions. Uh, thank you again, Sabina, for uh, giving this talk, giving us a lot of insight into the ETA project and how it goes, and for anytime, answering all the questions. Um, right. With that, uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker. So we go from ETA in the south of France to northeast Germany, where the W7X uh, Stellarator device is located. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have a live speaker, but we do have uh, a virtual tour of the W7X facility by Dr. Birger Guttenschön. And we will be available for questions afterwards. Um, it will be available for questions. Ah, he, he, but the, uh, Dr. Birger Guttenschön will be available for questions afterwards, I just heard. So um, yeah, let's have a look at the video. Welcome to the IPP, the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics here in Greifswald. My name is Birger Budenschön. I'm a research scientist here at the Institute working on Wendelstein 7X in the field of impurity spectroscopy. I am very pleased to have the opportunity to show you around today. So let's not waste time and follow me. There are 86 institutes in the Max Planck Society, all of them dealing with basic research in the fields of natural sciences, biology, social sciences and the arts, all for the public good. One of those 86 institutes is the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics. It was founded in 1960 by Werner Heisenberg in Garching, close to Munich. Today we are one of the largest institutes of the Max Planck family and our research is embedded in Eurofusion, the European collaboration for the development of fusion energy. The Greifswald part of the Institute was founded in 1994, shortly after the German reunion, and also in an effort to strengthen the research landscape in the former Eastern German uh, states. The foundation stone was laid in 1997 and from April 2000, people started moving into the new building and research started its way. When people moved into the institute in 2000, nothing was here. The device was not yet existing. The device, Wendelstein 7X, is a stellarator. As you may know, there are two different types of machines when we're talking about magnetic confinement fusion, stellarators and tokamaks. Let's have a look at the differences, the main difference of those machines on these LEGO models. For the tokamak, we have a very, very simple coil geometry. So these orange pieces here are the magnetic field coils. It's very simple, plain coils just built as a donut-shaped machine. That's essentially it, and all the additional parts that are required to confine the plasma are created by driving a current actually through the plasma and thus uh, creating a magnetic field structure which we will talk about later. 
Well, the Stellarator, the situation is a bit different. Here we have two different set of coils. These red ones are non-planar coils. The orange ones are also planar coils. And it's, it all looks very much more three-dimensional than for the, for the tokamak. This also results in a very three-dimensional plasma shape. So the plasma, plasma twists around and bends. And uh, the complexity of the plasma also mirrors in the complexity of the machine that was to be built here. The complexity of the magnetic field of Wendelstein 7X or W7X requires an intricate magnetic field coil system. The whole coil system is superconducting and it consists of essentially seven different coil types. So there are five different types of non-planar coils, those coils which are weirdly wound around the machine and two different types of planar coils. This is half a module of Wendelstein 7X. So if you take this and mirror it in this direction, you have one module and take this times five, you see Wendelstein 7X. The field coil structure remains the same. So we have 50 non-planar coils and 20 planar coils, 70 superconducting coils, which are mounted to a central support ring structure. The construction of this device was possible only after the supercomputers became fast enough to actually do extensive plasma simulations and calculations. A set of seven optimization criteria was employed to actually come up with a plasma shape which would be beneficial for the operation of a stellarator. And what people came up with is actually this plasma shape. So now we have a 50 million degrees hot plasma and we have a metal wall on the inside. It is clear that those two must never touch. So the shape of the plasma vessel, as you can see it here, also follows this twisted shape of the plasma itself to avoid a destruction of the inner plasma wall. Responsible for the creation of those magnetic fields that keep the plasma in its shape and away from the walls are the magnetic field coils, which are superconducting. To be superconducting, we need a temperature of roughly minus 270 degrees, 4.5 Kelvin. This is achieved by pushing liquid helium through the magnets. The magnets are constructed from pieces like this. There are roughly 250 individual strands in one of these aluminum alloy boxes and there's enough space between those strands to actually push the liquid helium at 4.5 Kelvin through and have a huge surface with which you can cool uh, all your conductors. Up to almost 20,000 amperes can be, can be circulated in the coils with this technology without resistive losses. There is actually one piece of the wall which is in contact with the plasma. You have to imagine you're putting in millions of watts of heating power. You're heating up particles and you're creating impurities in the plasma just by the, by the fusion reaction. Those impurities need to, need to get out of the plasma at some point and the part that is responsible for that is the diverter. The diverter is put in a place where it intersects the magnetic field in a way that particle fluxes are directed onto this piece which is designed in a way to sustain huge particle and energy fluxes on the order of 10 megawatts per square meter. This is the diverter or piece of the diverter of the predecessor of Wendelstein 7X of Wendelstein 7AS and you see that there was massive interaction of the plasma with these carbon tiles where you have these colorful lines, the so-called strike lines, we have erosion, redeposition of material. And you see that um, there, is, there is heavy interaction between the plasma and the walls if you have them in contact. One of the major improvements of Wendelstein 7X was after having three successful operating phases already, the installation of a new fully water-cooled diverter. So in this, in this schematics of Wendelstein 7X, we're talking now about these red pieces here, which are 
winding their way around the torus just like the plasma does to intersect the plasma at the desired position. The main purpose of the diverter, diverter is to flush out impurities. There are pumps behind this diverter to get rid of everything that is in the plasma that we do not want to have there. Now, Wendelstein 7X is still a research machine, an experiment. And we are curious people. We want to know what our plasma is doing. We want to scrutinize it as good as we can. So, one of the, one of the main challenges in constructing the device was integrating almost 300 different ports into the machine, which give us access to the plasma. Most of them, or many of them, are used for supply systems like cooling water, sensors, vacuum systems, gas inlets, and whatever you can imagine. Some of them are used for heating systems, and what is left is occupied by diagnosticians and their diagnostic systems to see what the plasma does from every position and every angle. One of the questions now is how do we heat our plasma? And we're taking advantage of the fact that the charged particles in our magnetic fields are gyrating around the field lines with a specific fre frequency that is determined mainly by the mass of their particles and the magnetic field strength. So if you imagine an electron gyrating around the field line and you hit it with an electromagnetic field of exactly the same frequency, you can transfer energy from this field to the particle. And that's exactly what we're doing with our electron cyclotron resonance heating. Now this is our main heating system up designed for up to 10 megawatts of heating power, just heating the electrons. You can imagine doing the same for the ions, actually. The ions are a little bit slower, so we're using a different frequency here, but we also have an ion cyclotron resonance heating, which will start operation just now in the upcoming operation phase. The third heating system that we are employing to again heat the ions is the neutral beam injection. This is a big system where you essentially accelerate ions, hydrogen ions, neutralize them again and have a neutral beam of particles, high energetic particles directed into the plasma where the energy of this neutral particle beam is transferred to the plasma ions via collisions. Those three heating systems now make sure that we can run decent plasmas with reactor-relevant parameters in Wendelstein 7X. So, now let's have a look at the machine. The safety regulations of IPP require that before you enter the Taurus Hall, you familiarize yourself with the current dangers that might occur when you're working inside the hall. So all those are listed up here. There's a book there where I need to put my signature stating that I've understood everything before I can enter the hall. We have now arrived in the central hall of the W7X, the heart of the Institute. Behind me you see the machine W7X. Not much to see though. There's mostly the outer vessel, some domes and ports, lots of cables and infrastructure. This is the central hall where the experiment is located and around us there's many different halls with auxiliary systems. On that side we have the cryo plant. Behind me there's a hall for the Easter age, the microwave heating systems. On that side we have a diagnostics hall over there where we came from. The ICRH, another heating system, is located and on top of that wall the control room is located. So behind me we see the W7X with all its domes and ports which are necessary for all the infrastructure that is required to operate the experiment. So the black things are cooling lines. There's a lot of cables hanging around on the machine. These red ones we will get to later. 
the pores are required for diagnostics access into the machine. And three of the most important diagnostics, I would say, are already visible from this position. Over here on this tower, which is the so-called Thompson Bridge, we have three diagnostics giving us vital information about our plasma properties, densities and temperatures. So there's a one-channel interferometer which gives us the line integrated density along its line of sight through the plasma, which is one of the most important diagnostics when it comes to feedback control of the plasma density. There is another diagnostics, the Thomson scattering right behind me where all those people are working, which gives us a profile, a profile of the density, the ele electron density and the electron temperature in the plasma at the very same location as the interferometer. And there's a third diagnostic, which is this nicely shiny tube lying there horizontally behind me, which is an X-ray spectrometer. This X-ray spectrometer looks at individual spectral lines of, for example, argon, which is introduced into the discharge, which gives us a profile of the ion temperature in the plasma. So with these three diagnostics, we know that the profiles and values of the electron and the ion density and temperature. So let's have a look at another diagnostics. From time to time, getting from here to there in the torus hall can be a little bit cumbersome. You need to get up and down of those scaffoldings. Done. So let's take a look at this. Behind me we have an exciting diagnostics which is the multipurpose manipulator. The multipurpose manipulator is used to bring diagnostics very very close to the plasma or even slightly inside the plasma. Those diagnostics can be electrostatic probes, magnetic probes, fluctuation diagnostics or little gas valves which, with which you can introduce gas into the machine or even just samples to test how those are coated by, by plasma processes inside. It is a long tube which can be moved two meters inside the plasma vessel just until the probe pad is just inside the inner wall of the plasma vessel and which can then be shot essentially by 20 or 30 centimeters with very high speed into the plasma and retract it as to not destroy any diagnostics mounted on the probe head. On our way through the torus hall around the machine, we are now passing by a part of our major heating system, the ECRH system. So in this location, we have two launches with three microwave beams each. Each of them has a cooled copper mirror at the front right at the plasma uh, which can be moved and so the microwave beams can be steered and you can exactly say where the plasma is heated where those microwave beams are directed so we're now standing in front of my own diagnostics the one i'm responsible for this is a vacuum ultraviolet spectrometer actually it's four spectrometers integrated into one device this is, this spectrometer serves one purpose, which is actually the impurity situation in the plasma. Impurities meaning everything that is heavier than what we're putting in as fuel, be it hydrogen, deuterium, or helium. Where we have the basic plasma properties with densities and profiles on the other end of the machine, we also need additional properties of the plasma, like how are particles transported inside or outside of the plasma, into or outward of the plasma. With the VOV spectroscopy, this is a task we can do. We are introducing impurities into the machine and observing how individual spectral lines of those impurities behave in time. And from that, we can deduce the transport properties of particles within the plasma. We have now moved two stories up. We're now above the machine and as you can see, it's not much better visible from up here than from down there. It actually is a toroidal shape with 16 meters outer diameter of the outer vessel 
at the height of the base machine of the outer vessel of four and a half meters. Now, what is the mission of W7X? We want to demonstrate that the modular stellarator concept we are pursuing here is actually a success. And a success it would be if we can show good energy and particle confinement in stable plasmas for continuous operation. This obviously includes mastering the technologies of the superconducting coils, actively cooled in-vessel components, and continuously available high-power heating systems. In the end, we want to show that this stellarator is capable of producing plasmas which are comparable in their properties to those produced in a tokamak of approximately the same size. The ultimate goal for W7X is running a stable, fusion-relevant plasma for 1,800 seconds, 30 minutes, to show the essential property of such a stellarator, which is the continuous operation. We're now in the control room of Wendelstein 7X, the brain of the machine, if you want. So the control room is divided into two parts, essentially. The most important part, for some of us at least, is this area right behind me. This bell-shaped area here is where the experiment leader sits, programs the experiment programs and runs them. There are people dealing with the security of the machine and essentially all the people who take care of the central machine and the functionality that is required to actually start, run and end a plasma program. In the second part of the control room, at least in non-COVID times, there are up to 90 physicists sitting at their places, looking at their diagnostics and observing what is going on with the plasma. So, for example, like this data from my spectrometer, which you have already met down in the Taurus Hall. For more information on the machine status, on the experiment, what's planned, what's happening, we have this big screen in front of the room where central information is displayed for everybody. So we have reached the end of our tour. It was a pleasure showing you around and having you here. And if you're interested in seeing more or seeing all this live and in action, Feel free to contact us to have a visit in person here in Greifswald. So have a very nice day and see you soon. So thank you. And in the meantime, uh, Dr. Birger Buttenschön has also arrived. So we are promoting him to panelist as we speak uh, so that he also will be able to answer all your questions. Uh, so feel free to ask any question you'd like about uh, W7X uh, in the Q&A. <laughs> Let's see, there's already one quite div divisive question starting. Um, but I'm sure our guest speaker will have a good you know, opinion about that. Hello. Hello. Nope. Welcome. Everything was crystal clear. Very good. Yeah, there's already one question. Uh, uh, who is uh, the lead right now, Stellarator or Tokamak? Sorry, I don't see that question. Where is that? Uh, in the Q&A, uh, the chat is, I think, Probably not available. I was off to re-sign in as a panelist. Can you repeat that question, please? Uh, someone said, uh, Michael Smith said, can it be said, who is the lead right now, Stellarator or Tokamak? The, <laughs> the lead in what? Um, currently, I would say, technology-wise, the Tokamak is the one who is leading because that's the machine that is simpler build that we have more experience with that is uh, to some extent um, 
better known how to be controlled. So it has um, it has some properties that that give us gives it the advantage of kind of being a little bit ahead. This is also the reason why ETA, for example, is built as a tokamak, right? Um, the Stellarator line has been neglected a bit since a while. Um, W7X is the first big advanced Stellarator the world has built. So we're trying to catch up right now. Um, so it depends on what you what you want to look at. If we if we look into steady state operation, for example, the Stellarator inherently is the better option because there's no pulse, no pulsed current drive. There's no need to switch that thing off. No need to develop specific um, specific technologies to um, to make that steady state cable. Well, it's just built in. So we're just not there yet. We're we're starting our operation and. We will see. Good. The next question I see is how far are you with a stable plasma and how do you get the energy out of the beam when the plasma stops? Um, stable plasma, again, the question is for how long? So the longest plasma we have done in the last operation phase was 100 seconds. That is pretty stable, I would say. It is also pretty boring because nothing happens. Um, so that worked. That was at relatively low power and relatively low density. Um, we have now upgraded the machine to a fully water-cooled state. The diverter is water-cooled, walls are water-cooled. We are now in a position where we can actually run plasmas as the machine was originally built to be. So with 10 megawatts or more, depending on which heating systems we use, um, for up to 30 minutes. That is something that we will certainly not reach within the next one or two years. Um, but we will we will relatively quickly, hopefully, evolve to a situation where we have hundreds of seconds discharges routinely uh, sitting stable in the machine. So I would say we're on a good track. The energy out of the beams, so probably the plasma, um, when the plasma stops, there it essentially just dissolves. Um, so. As soon as we stop heating, the, the plasma starts recombining. Um, things are pumped away. So we're hitting the, the diverter for a while and essentially pumping the plasma, the remaining plasma and the gas that is that is recombined away. That's that's the way we go. The field is still up all the time, right? Um, so we, we always have the magnetic confinement so the plasma does not reach the wall. So it's, it's leaving the machine on the way it's supposed to be, so mostly via the diverter. Good. Um, happened to hype. What happened to hype of the American way to use many laser beams for the fusion reaction? Um, already dropped. Well, I, I, I actually don't know it under the name Hyper. Um, there is um, the National Ignition Facility in the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that is still being developed. So this concept of um, of laser fusion is very much out there. Um, they every now and then um, there is a there is a press briefing telling us that they have reached a new milestone. So just recently, I think last year it was that um, they had kind of kind of a break even point in the sense that the energy that was actually coupled into their uh, into their small pellet, which they used for the fusion, was um, was balanced almost balanced by the. By the fusion reaction, but that was for one pallet. There was a, f a, a small fraction of the energy that's um, used to power the lasers. So that concept is very, very far from something you would call steady state. But it's still out there. It's still out there, and it's, it, it is a concept that is that is being pursued. Absolutely. Are there concrete plans yet for an ITER size or bigger <laughs> successor of W7X? Plans, we have a lot. Um, we do have, well, we, we do our research on um, kind of looking, looking into the, the whole system's behavior of a Stellarator power plant and trying to figure out what, what would be the best configuration to go if we actually would want to build a, a Stellarator-based power plant capable of producing something like one gigawatt electric power. That machine would be big. That machine would be a little bit bigger than ITER actually with an outer diameter of roughly 60 meters. Um, so it's W7X times four. 
Um, that would be based on the W7X line, the Helios line um, of stellarators. There are every now and then new concepts, mostly in terms of how the magnetic field geometry looks like coming up, which might lead to machines that are a little bit smaller, that are maybe a little bit more efficient to build. But yes, we do have these plans. Um, we are, we're looking into all of the all of the parameters that we can play with and that we know how how they actually influence how you would build such a machine. Um, and if somebody out there is willing to give us a few a few billion euros, we're essentially ready to build it. Ah, not just, but yes, those plans exist. Oh, that is a good question. What would be a re realistic year we could be able to see a net output of electric energy, whatever fusion concept? Um, in the currently evolving landscape of also private fusion um, companies popping up, I find that very difficult to answer. As far as I know, um, the, Europe, the, the, the kind of politically set European concept for fusion energy states something around 2060 for a, um, for a demonstration power plant that would actually be able to deliver power to a grid. It would not be the biggest power plant, probably something like on, on, on the ballpark of 500 megawatts electric power. But that, that's kind of, a, if you look on the political side and the EU side, um, that's, that's the way, that's, that's roughly the time frame we're, we're talking about. With, with all the private companies popping up and also the UK and the US investing lots of money into, into building or, or looking into building new sites for fusion research and fusion power plants, it might be earlier, I, I just can't say. So say mid, <laughs> end, end of 21st century, I, I, would, I was about to say mid of 21st century. So let's, let's see. Um, what advice would you have for students who are interested in fusion energy? Well, there's an answer coming already. Um, so from my point of view, from the, from the purely IPP point of view, we are always happy to, um, to host internships, to, to kind of get a, get a peek into the fusion world, how that's, how that's done at IPP, what we are doing. Um, there obviously are always positions for PhD students available. We do, we do master thesis and everything. So um, at IPP, the usual route would be to start with an internship, contact us, start with an internship um, and see if that's the way to go. Unfortunately, there are very little, very little universities in, in Germany, at least, who are actually doing high temperature plasma physics. It's uh, getting less and less, unfortunately. Also to add to that, on the FuseNet website, we have a list of all the university programs in nuclear fusion. Uh, most of them are master programs. Um, so yeah, if you have students asking how to get in, into fusion, uh, the first step is, is doing a bachelor's in either physics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and then later specializing into fusion uh, by doing either a master or for instance, there's also people doing a more control focused master that then uh, dive right into the control aspects of fusion, etc. So there's many pathways to fusion. Uh, but I, I think most of them start with an, a physics, mechanical engineering, or electrical engineering background. Okay. Don't see further questions. Yeah, if, if there are no further questions, then I would like to thank you, uh, well, uh, first for sending us the, the beautiful video and the tour of W7X and also for answering all the questions that uh, the teachers so far had. Um, so yeah, if, if perhaps another question from my side in, in, for the teachers, um, if they want to visit W7X, they should contact you through the website, I, I think. Exactly, there's, there's, um, there's a contact email address on the website. If you, if you look onto the, the IPP website, um, I can quickly post the 
the thing here. Yeah, I, so, I see Beate already. Uh, all right, perfect. In the, yes. in so there's the, there's, there's the, the link uh, where you can where you can make an appointment for a visit. Yes. Then, uh, yeah, I, I would say we, we have some uh, 10 minutes left in our global session. Uh, so don't let your questions be contained uh, about being only about W7X, but well, we still have an expert on W7X here around. So feel free to keep asking questions. Um, yeah, and I hope you all enjoyed the, the teacher day and uh, well, learned a lot about fusion and uh, enjoyed seeing the latest status of fusion research. Um, and to close the session, I would like to give the word to our FuseNet Executive Officer, Dario Cruz. Hello, everyone, again. So since I'm not going to share any video, I hope we don't have any, any problems. I just wanted uh, to, to go back a little bit to the, to the words of, of uh, Rod Ivan, uh, the chair of the FuseNet Executive, uh, the FuseNet um, Association. So, as as the the role we believe you as teachers have in the in in, in the effective deployment of, of uh, fusion for the future. So, like he said, we do believe that the fusion education uh, really starts from the early stage, especially because you are aware now of the time scale that the fusion project uh, requires until the the effective. Uh, deployment of uh, electricity production in the world so there is this is a this is a stage process that requires that the future generations will be able to to operate these machines and we will 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 have the knowledge and capability of of delivering electricity into the grid and this starts by formation of students right now so of course we have now some bright minds as researchers as phd students as professors and this is the this is the people who's pushing the the fusion effort in europe and worldwide at the moment but of course this generation is not going to last forever and we have to be able to to do some proper knowledge transfer to the next generation that are coming and this is the important role that you have uh, for for the fusion uh, effort that uh, it is it is the, the the students that you are forming now those who are going to take over on the on the fusion effort of the whole world so we are uh, really thankful that you have attended these sessions that you are interested in the in the fusion in the fusion field and in the in the fusion um, activities and we hope that you can transmit this interest and this uh, curiosity to your students so that we can uh, finally all together all the 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 current generations and the and the next generation we can all of us uh, fulfill this uh, this task which started as a dream but now we're working hard and we're seeing results so it's not anymore just a dream it is something that we're solidly working on and something that we are going to achieve in the future so this is an this is an important part of, of fusion development an important stage where we are needed to train the new generation near to uh, wake up that curiosity on on the fusion field and again i cannot stress enough the importance of the teachers in in this in this task so yeah from my side and from the side of fusion i would like to thank you very much for being here we are still we are uh, always available for your questions for your comments for any initiatives that you want to to discuss with us we are an education association so we are always uh, happy to 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 have some share initiatives with you uh so yeah so i think i just wanted to 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 let you know what uh, what our 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 feeling is for for you being part of this of these uh sessions and of, on, of our activities and yeah i would like to also to thank you for the participation of of, of uh, ether and and wendelstein as they are the, the leading experiments at the moment for the two concepts that that uh, are are uh, being developed in from the european side of the world point of view so accelerator and tokamak thank you to the experts for attending here and for answering the questions and yeah let's uh, to the teachers i would encourage you to not to not lose the contact with us let's be in touch and whatever we joint initiatives we can develop we'll be happy to so i think that's it from my side i'll give the floor back to sander and then we're able to close the session thank you so much Thank you, Dario. Um, yeah, with that, I, I think we can end on a, on a nice note. Uh, so thank you all again for attending and uh, 
hopefully until next year.